record. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you just so I can go over a couple of things, some of the questions that you guys have been bringing up, and then just some extra information that I wanted to share. Um, so for right now, all we have is the orientation. I will get rid of that um, probably today because I believe everyone was successful in going through the whole um, orientation. So we don't really need that class orientation video anymore. Um, but as far as the rest of the class, everything's going to be here in unit one up until about September the 22nd. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to click on the unit one module overview, just so that you can see the timeline for everything. My daughter forgot to close the door. Give me one second. Okay. Um, so last week we did the orientation on Tuesday and then we did 9.4 on Thursday. Today we're going to talk about 6.1. And then if you follow the calendar, that puts us at the 16th of when everyone should have done, should have at least attempted the review so that you have an idea of some questions that you want to ask. Um, and then that Monday after the weekend is when everything is like certainly due, okay? So you can keep working on those homework assignments and improving those scores up until that 20th, okay? Um, and then on the 21st, we will have our first test and it just depends on, um, so it's actually a typo in the module because the due date should be the 21st, not the 22nd. Um, if we have an in-person test, then we'll administer it in class. If not, if we're still remote for some reason at that point in time, um, we can do the test online a lot like the way you did the readiness quiz, okay? So you do the, the test on the computer, and then when you're done, you upload your paperwork afterward, okay? And you have to go through all of the lockdown browser um, steps and everything so that you can get in and your camera set up and everything's good to go, okay? So that's a backup method in case we're not able to um, uh, be in person by then, okay? If we are in person by then, we should, I should find out um, hopefully by the end of this week because that would be good to know if I need to come in on Tuesday. And I know all of you would like to know if um, you need to come in that Tuesday on the 7th, okay? So just, I'll keep you posted as soon as I find out something one way or the other, whether we are coming back or we're not, um, I will send out a remind um, text and let you guys know what the status is on, on returning, okay? Now, um, the class recordings are gonna be placed here right underneath that overview. So that's just to kind of, you know, so you have like a game plan of when things are gonna be posted and when I'm gonna be talking about things. And then I will be posting everything here. So for the last class, it was the first um, lecture class that we had. And so the video is this first link. And then the second thing is an actual PDF file. So if you click it, you'll see the pages that I was writing on. So that's why I mentioned to you guys, you might not wanna be trying to like scribble everything that's on the screen. And I really don't have time. Most of the times I won't have time. Maybe every now and then we'll finish a little bit early, but for the most part, it's a lot of information and I will need the whole class period, okay? Um, so I, I can't just keep the page up there and wait till everybody scribbles down everything before I can move on, okay? So just really use the class time to just pay attention and watch what I'm doing. And then like as questions come up, um, you ask those questions. As far as like trying to scribble everything down, it'll be there for you to print it later. Or if you're one of those people that prefers to handwrite it, it'll be there for you to hand copy it um, later, okay? So don't try to scribble everything down. And then I had a few people asking me about those practice problems. And the solutions are here. So once the examples ended, um, I did put the practice problems in there so you can see uh, those solutions, okay? Now, I had a lot of questions about division and a lot of questions about solving systems of equations. Um, 
those are methods that were talked about in college algebra. So ideally you should have seen it before. I'm not necessarily saying you, you know, you would have mastered it, but, <laughs> but you should have certainly seen it. So when I'm going through it, I try to go relatively slow. So that way everybody's on the same page. Um, but if you're not understanding that part, you may need to go um, into the textbook and go practice um, some stuff from that section. So I'm gonna show you a couple of things before I get into this section, okay? One is I'm gonna show you where to find the ebook and how to access like college algebra material for you to practice on, okay? So let me close this window here and let me go back to modules. And then like someone said, there's one homework that I have up there so far. There's more, but I haven't put them in there yet. I'll go drag this one up there. Um, but dun, dun, dun. I was trying to see if I made an ebook link for you, but I didn't. That's okay. I can put one, but I just want to show you something first. So I'm going to click on the 9.4. And I'm going to click on open a new window. And so this is typically what you guys should be seeing. When you click on them, it should be taking you into WebAssign so that you can see that um, assignment. And then if you scroll, let me give it a second. Now, if I scroll to the top, I can click on home or I can click on my eBooks, okay? My home will take you to all the other homework assignments. Um, and you can see kind of like all the due dates and all that if you wanted to, or you can go here to the eBook. You can also click on read it with inside um, each problem and it also takes you to the um, textbook, okay? But I'm gonna click on ebook and you want to select this book down here that says algebra and trig, okay? That's the book that we use. You might not have this calculus book as an option. I think it just recognizes me and as an instructor and these are all the three books I use. So you would click on that link there with the green book and then it'll verify your Cengage credentials. And once it does, it will let you into the book. And then you can kind of navigate in there to see all the different topics. Oh, computers, what fun, right? It's loading. While that's loading, I also, aside from the book and getting extra information from there, of course, you can always Google topics like you can Google how do I solve systems of equations and then there will be all kinds of YouTube videos from all kinds of people, different personalities, explaining how to do the um, solving systems of equations. If you don't know how to divide polynomials there, you could just go Google search. How do you divide um, polynomials? it'll go through whole all these YouTube videos of all these different people going and doing that as well. So you always have the basic internet as a, um, oh, it's not that even do it. Um, <laughs> but you always have the regular internet as a resource as well, in addition to me, in addition to your textbook and all of that good stuff. Okay, and there now it looks like it's gonna do something. I don't know what happened the first time. Okay. So this book does cover all of the algebra stuff, and then it gets into the um, pre-cal stuff when we get to chapter six, okay? But if you go here to where it says polynomial functions, I think that's the section where it starts to talk about division, long division, um, and systems of equations. So here's the long division. You go in there, there's lots of little links, there's little videos you can click on, the whole lesson's in there if you read through it explains the process of dividing polynomials. Um, and then I think systems of equations isn't until this book um, does it differently. So I'm gonna close this. And I think it's right here in chapter nine. Now college algebra also does chapter nine and chapter 10 in this book. So this book doesn't have it in the same order that we teach it. Um, but it is in there. So I don't want to go to this section. I want to go to, oh, where is it? The method of elimination. 
So we go to 9.2 and then look at the method of elimination. There's also the method of substitution, but for us, sometimes we have a whole bunch of equations. The method of elimination is going to be our best one, okay? And so you can click on that. Again, it has a whole lesson. It has videos in there. It has practice problems. It has all kinds of stuff that you can go in and revamp your skills on those particular subjects, okay? So I just wanted you to make be, be aware that the ebook is inside WebAssign and you can go look at old material just to make sure you're on par um, with this class so that we can continue. Now, um, someone asked about my um, office hours and I just wanted to mention that I don't have, you know, like a large amount of availability because I do teach other classes aside from this one. Um, and I do have um, other hours that I need to dedicate to getting the courses set up for those online classes. Um, and then of course I have like my committee work where I'm on different committees and I have to meet with those committees and we have to do work projects and things like that for those committees. So I'm not available like, you know, from 7.30 in the morning all the way to 4.30 in the afternoon, like my hours that I work because I'm doing different things during all of those different times, right? These are the hours of availability that I do have specifically for answering your guys' emails, answering your remind texts, um, and then making sure, you know, if I need to do any Zoom sessions with you guys, that's the time that I do it, is during those dedicated hours each week, okay? However, I don't refuse messages. If I get a message and I see it, I usually I try to respond because I like to get things off my to-do list, okay? <laughs> um, so if I get a text message from you, that's the fastest way to contact me. That is the most immediate way you know I'm gonna check it right away. Um, if you email me, I don't typically go and check my email unless I'm at my desk and I'm checking my email. But my remind, it's on my cell phone. It just texts me like a normal text in my cell phone. And so those I see right away um, and I respond to them as soon as I can. Even if I'm in the middle of cooking dinner or sitting at the dinner table with the kids, I mean, I can answer text real quick, okay? Um, so I wanted to show you guys an example of someone who's been utilizing the text a lot. And I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of how um, I expect you to ask for help if you do ask for help by text. It's super convenient, which is why um, a lot of people choose to use text to ask for help versus trying to set up Zoom sessions during my office hours. Not that I'm against Zoom sessions. I would love to sit there with you during the Zoom session and go through stuff. Um, there's not an issue. This is just an alternative in case the timing is not working for you um, or you just want to get something answered really, really quick, okay? And you don't want to wait until um, a Zoom session to do that, okay? So what I want you to do when you text me is send me a picture of the problem. And so this person just grabbed their phone, took a photo and then sent it as a text, right? This is the problem they're working. And then if your answer is not already in there, sometimes it is inside the box. And so I can already see um, what you're trying to input and I can usually help you from there. But if that's not enough for me, I might actually ask you to send me a picture of your steps, like your work. Um, and so this is an example of, it looks like he printed this assignment and then was scribbling on it. Um, but that's what I'm talking about is just sending me a picture of the problem and then sending me a picture of whatever you've done, okay? And then that's the best way that I can help you because I can see your steps. I can see where you're going wrong um, or maybe you forgot something. Like in this case, he just forgot a negative in the front and I just told him that and he was like, yeah, hey, I got it right. Um, so just wanted to make you guys aware that that is an option um, to, to do. You don't have to wait around for the Zoom sessions um, to get help, okay? Okay, with all that said, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that. And then I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to my paper camera or document camera. Um, so you can see the lesson for today. Now there's lots and lots of information. So again, I'm not expecting you to try to scribble all of that down. Um, and you probably won't have time to because I'm just gonna read through it and then keep going, okay? But this section is going to cover the very, very beginning, just the introduction of what the heck is an angle and how, how do we measure them? 
Okay. And I started writing it with one color and then it faded. And then I started writing it with another pen and that one started fading. Eventually I got to a good pen and it, it came out a little bit darker. So bear with me with the, the pin ship on this. Um, I tried my best and then I tried to correct it as soon as I noticed there was an issue. So in this section, we're gonna have lots and lots of definitions at the beginning because we kind of have to set the tone for what is all going on, okay? So the first definition that we have here is that it says rotating a ray and a ray looks like this. It's a point and then a line with one arrow, okay? And that's called a ray. In college algebra, you were used to what are called lines and that's where it goes forever in both directions, okay? So this one doesn't go forever. It has a starting point and then it goes in a direction, okay? So it's different. And that little point right there where it starts is called the end point. So it says a rotating ray about its end point determines an angle, okay? So imagine my pen is the ray where this eraser, this gray eraser is the end point and then the ray is shooting in that direction towards my clicker, okay? When you take this ray, wherever it was positioned originally, and then you rotate it about the end point. So if I grab that end point and then I rotate it about the end point, what you've created is called an angle. And that's all that definition is saying. And it says the starting position of the ray is called the initial side. So imagine this was, this is the ray that you start with. And then once it rotates where it lands is called the terminal side. Now, Typically, we call, and it's not till down here, but we call that endpoint since we rotate it around it. Once you rotate around that endpoint, it's now called a vertex of this angle. Okay. And then, you know, it's great. We can have all these rays all over the place on our paper, but typically we like to translate them onto the coordinate system you know, the X axes and the Y axes. So when we position it onto the coordinate system, that is called an angle in standard notation or standard position. So your initial side will always lie on the positive X axes. And then depending on what the angle is, the other um, terminal side could be in this quadrant. It could be in that quadrant. It could rotate all the way down here where it's in the third quadrant. It could rotate all the way around here where it's in the fourth quadrant, okay? Um, it just depends on how large that angle is. So that's what this is saying. It's saying when the origin is the vertex and the initial side coincides with the positive X axis, the angle is in standard position. So notice the vertex, the end point of the rays is on the origin. And then the initial side is on the positive X axis. The terminal side will be who knows where, okay? That depends on the angle. So then now the next definition says two angles that have the same initial and terminal sides are called coterminal, not necessarily equivalent, okay? And I'm gonna give you an example why they use this word instead of um, you know, equivalent. Because if I have a ray that starts here and then I rotate it so that now it's over here, okay? So I rotated it that way, right? This is the initial ray and, or the initial side and then this is the terminal side. Well, what happens if I take that ray and I rotate it around one whole time and then around again and I land in the same spot, right? Those are not equivalent angles. One of them, I did not go all the way around. And the other one, I did go all the way around, okay? So that they're not considered equivalent, but they are considered coterminal, okay? So I do want you to be aware of that. We'll get into the measurements of them and everything and how to find coterminal angles and all of that in the same section, okay? So the next definition says the amount of rotation from the side, from the initial side to the terminal side determines the measure of an angle. 
the most common unit of an angle measure is the degree. And we denote it by using that little tiny circle. It kind of is in the position of where an exponent would be. It's a superscript. So there's an example where you have the number one and then the degree. It's kind of in the position like a power, like an exponent would be. Um, a measure of one degree, which looks like this when you write it down, is equivalent to a rotation of one over 360. And it's 360 degrees in a whole circle, right? We, that's why they use this measurement, okay? Now, here's more definitions. We've got like two more pages of definitions. It says angles between zero and 90 degrees are called acute angles. Angles with measures between 90 degrees and 180 degrees are considered obtuse angles. That you may have remembered from geometry. Um, if you have two positive angles, alpha and beta, those are called complementary when you add them together and you get 90. If you add them together and you get 180, then they're called supplementary. Okay. And I remember C before S and 90 before 180. That's how I remember which one goes with which. Now, one radian. So, radian is another unit of measurement for angles. Okay. So, there's degrees, but then we also have another measurement called radians. And normally you say rad or rads and that stands for radian, okay? And normally if you see a number, all the numbers you've ever seen, like when you see the number five, when you see the number negative two, if those were representing angles, those are radians, okay? Unless it specifically says the little degree symbol, it is considered a radian by default, okay? And so a lot of times when you're using radians, you won't see any units whatsoever. It won't even say rad. It'll just have nothing, okay? So that's gonna be a little bit um, tricky to get used to at the beginning, but we'll talk about it as it keeps coming up, okay? Um, excuse me. Sure. Uh, what is between a central angle and that? What is that little symbol? That is a theta. It's a circle with a line straight across. Theta? Theta, T-H-E-T-A. Theta. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And so if I were to position, you know, my rays onto the coordinate system, the X and the Y, um, what they're saying is, is that this measurement here, if that were my rate, that measurement there, that length there is R. And then of course, if I'm rotating it, then the length isn't changing, right? It's still R. Okay. But if you map it so that whatever that length is, it's actually the radius of a circle, then you have a circle on top of your coordinate system, okay? And when you create that angle, they label it theta, which literally looks like a zero and a line through it, okay? And then it tells you that they, they call this the central angle because you notice I'm in the center of the circle and then it's rotating around that center. So it is called a central angle. And it intercepts the art, which is this measurement here, to the length of the radius in the circle. So you have this formula essentially right here, where S is the length of the arc and R is the length of the, of the ray. And it doesn't matter whether you're taking the initial side or the terminal side, because they both have the same length. It's essentially the same ray just being rotated, right? So you can figure out that angle by taking this measurement here, okay? This is going to come into play a lot when we start talking about angles and triangles, okay? The interesting thing about trig is you're going to see a whole bunch of circles and a whole bunch of triangles in this class, okay? It's a lot, a lot, a lot of geometry, so to speak. Okay, so we have some conversions here that we need to talk about. Um, you can convert between the two different measurements. 
you can convert between radians and degrees, okay? So I'm going to map this out, and I want to talk about it as I do it. We know that if you have a um, perpendicular lines, that that creates a 90 degree angle, right? So if this is zero degrees, then rotating in this manner would make this angle right here 90 degrees. Then if I rotate another 90 degrees, now I'm talking about 180 degrees. And if I rotate another 90 degrees, now I'm talking about 270 degrees. And then if I rotate another 90 degrees, I'm back at the original place. And that made a full circle at 360 degrees. Okay. Now what they're telling us is that one radian equals um, 180 degrees over pi. Okay. Because this whole thing is one radian. So from here, to here is one radian. And then if I go the other way, now, oops, that doesn't look like a circle, but <laughs> you get the idea. Now I'm at two radians. Okay. And normally when we're talking about radians, they use the measurement of pi. Okay. So I know you have heard um, circumference, right? You know that circumference is two pi r, okay? And then what they do is they say, just let the radius equal one. Let's pretend that the radius is equal one. Then the circumference is two pi, which means that from here all the way around is going to be two pi units, which means if I only go half of the way, this is pi units. So notice that it's telling me that pi is the same thing as 180 degrees and 360 degrees is the same as two pi. That's where this conversion came from because pi and 180 are 180 degrees are the same measurements. Okay. And the same thing here, 180 degrees and pi are the same measurement. So how do I convert between the two um, forms? If you're going from decimal to radians, you're going to take your decimal number, whatever it is, and you're going to multiply it by pi over 180 degrees. Essentially, the degrees from this um, degree form will cancel with this degree unit and then leaving you with just the radians. Okay. And then if you're converting from radians to, de to um, degrees, then the radians here and the radians here should be canceling, leaving you with the degree. Okay, and we're gonna definitely have examples on how to do all of that, okay? Definitely, definitely. But before we can get there, I got some more definitions, okay? So the top one says, for a circle of radius R and the central angle theta, they intercept the arc of length S given by that formula. It's the same formula we had before. We had um, S over R. Notice if I multiply both sides by R, I now have this formula, right? S is equivalent to R times theta, okay? That's called the link of circular arc. And normally we measure angles in radians whenever, not normally, we do. Whenever we're measuring, uh, trying to calculate arc, your angle does need to be in radian mode. So you're never going to type in a degree right here. You're gonna take your radius and you're gonna multiply it by your angle in radians. So now we know why we need to convert because if I'm giving you the uh, angle in degrees, you can't plug in degrees right here. You'd have to convert it to radians first and then plug it in there. Okay, but theta represents your angle. And then R represents your radius and S represents your arc length. Now we get into some more situations going on here. So it says, consider a particle moving at constant speed along a circular arc of radius R. 
if S is the arc length traveled in time T, then the linear speed V of the particle can be calculated using this measurement here. So linear speed can be calculated by taking the arc length over your measurement of time. Okay, and then again, just to reiterate, that angle must be in radians. There's also another measurement called angular speed, which we denote using, it's called omega, but it's like a weird little w. But we can find angular speed or omega by taking the central angle over the unit of time. And I just wanna make sure that you also understand this because this wasn't really explained in the textbook, but I need you guys to know this as well, okay? So a lot of these formulas will be provided whenever you do the test. But while you're doing the homework, you need to know these formulas, okay? Your angle will always equal two pi times the revolutions per time. Because remember, to go all the way around, you gotta go two pi units, okay? So however many units per, um, however many revolutions you make per second or how many revolutions you make per hour, um, that measurement has to get multiplied by two pi in order to figure out the angle. Again, we will see lots of examples in a little bit. Two more things when you talk about. Um, for a circle that has a radius r, you can find the area of what is called a sector. So we already know that this measurement on the outside of the circle was called an arc link, arc link. But if you were to shade in that whole region created by the terminal side and the initial side, you could find the area of that little section and it's called a sector. And all you're doing is doing one half times your radius squared times your angle, whatever that is, as long as your angle is in radians, okay? And there are some more units of measurements when it comes to um, when it comes to minutes and um, seconds to the degrees. So you can get smaller than a degree. So one degree is not the smallest angle measurement. You can get smaller, and they're called minutes. And you usually use it looks like a, an apostrophe. So one degree equals 60 minutes. This is used a lot in navigation, like in boats and planes and things like that, okay? Because they do need to get more precise than just a degree. One minute is equivalent to 60 seconds. And their measurements match pretty much like the way time goes, right? That's the case in just regular time, one minute equals 60 seconds. It's also the same in angles. And then one degree, of course, if you put these two together, one degree would equal 3,600 seconds. So I know you can't see this because my pin um, bled into itself or it, um, but that's seconds. So two little apostrophes for seconds, and this is 3,600 seconds. This is gonna be important too, because they are gonna ask us some navigational problems, and we do need to know how to convert back and forth between degrees, minutes, and seconds, okay? So you have two different, three different modes. You can have radians, right? You can have degrees, but the degrees can be written in two different ways, as decimal degrees or as degrees, minutes, and seconds. So we're gonna see, start seeing these examples now and we're gonna start seeing all this information put together, okay? So this is a lot of information at the beginning, but eventually we'll put it to use. So here is the first practice problem. So it says, determine the quadrant in which each angle lies. So in order for me to do that, the first thing I wanna do is actually label my quadrants in case you don't know what they're labeled, okay? So this quadrant here where you're talking about the positive x-axis and the positive y-axis, 
This is called the first quadrant. Then when you're talking about the positive y-axis, but the negative x-axis, that's quadrant two. When you're doing the negative x-axis and the negative y-axis, that's quadrant three. And then when you're doing the negative y-axis, but the positive x-axis, that's quadrant four. So shorthand, the one on the top right is one, and then it goes counterclockwise, the opposite of the way the clock works. So it's one, two, three, four. Now I already mentioned in that little picture that I drew before that this is considered zero degrees or 360 degrees. And then this one appears at 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. It's important to know those measurements so that we know where these angles are positioned, where their terminal sides are positioned. So they're all gonna have an initial side, right? Over here, that's the initial side. But when I rotate that um, ray, I have to rotate it 160 degrees. So it's definitely gonna go past the 90, but not quite all the way to the 180. So just as a rough sketch, it's probably somewhere around here, okay? And this is that angle that they're measuring, okay? So what quadrant is that in? That's actually going to be in the second quadrant for part A. So for part A, 160 degrees is in the second quadrant. For 305, it's gonna go all the way around past 90, past 180, past 270, but it's not gonna get all the way to 360. It might be like almost halfway in between them. Again, this is just a rough sketch. It's not exactly per se. Um, but the angle goes from the initial side all the way around until you get to the terminal side. And that angle all the way around is 305 degrees. But what they want to know is what quadrant do we get stuck in? Our terminal side is here in quadrant four. So this one would be quadrant four. Now, personally, I have to graph it in order to know which quadrant it's gonna be in. Some people might know, you know, this is 0, 90, 180, 270, and 360. And so they can just tell, oh, that's between 90 and 180, so it's gonna be in quadrant two. Or, oh, this is 305. That's between 270 and 360, so it's gonna be down here in quadrant four. That's fantastic if you can do that. Um, I am a visual person. So I always sketch the angle first before deciding which um, quadrant it's in, okay? So when it comes to practice two, it's not anything different than I just did for practice one. I'm just gonna sketch it and then that's all I'm gonna do. I don't have to tell them what quadrant I'm in, okay? So for this first one, here's your initial side and then you're gonna rotate 60 degrees. Remember, this top one is 90 degrees, so I'm not going to go all the way up to 90 degrees. I'm only going to go about two-thirds of the way, which is 60 degrees, okay? And that's all we need to graph is this terminal side. So when you go on the computer, it may not even have the initial side on there, because in standard position, we already know that the initial side is the positive x-axis. Like, that's already known, so they typically don't graph it. So you may not see this line in your choices. You may just see the positive x-axis and then the angle and then the terminal side. What's the terminal side? The terminal side is where I end up after I rotate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it could be anywhere on the graph? Anywhere. It depends on what the angle is. Yep. Okay. Okay, so for this one, 
is going to be 120. So we know this is 90 degrees and this is 180 degrees. So it's got to be somewhere in between there. But it's probably going to be a little bit closer to 90 degrees. So I would imagine it's about, um, about right there. Again, I'm not fantastic at drawing this stuff. You're going to have a bunch of choices. And it's going to have one over here in this quadrant, one over there in that quadrant, one over here in this quadrant. <laughs> so the answers are going to be way off. You need to know which one it is, OK? You're not going to have one that's like this and then another one that's like a slightly bit underneath it. That's not going to happen to you. All the answers are going to be obviously different from one another. OK. Now, this is something we haven't talked about yet. What does that mean to have a negative angle? So notice that in the standard position, your initial side is always on the positive x-axis, and then you're rotating about, right? But notice what direction you're rotating about. You're always rotating in the counterclockwise rotation. So when the angles are positive, your rotation does need to be counterclockwise. When the angle's negative, that makes the angle or the rotation negative, which means clockwise, the opposite of what we were doing before. So before, we were starting with the initial side and going counterclockwise. Now that I have a negative rotation, I'm going to go clockwise. So here's my thing there. And instead of going this way, 0, 90, 180, 270. So instead of going in this direction, 270 degrees, I actually have to go in the other direction, 270 degrees. Okay. So I actually have to go in this direction. And I end up with my terminal side going straight up. Now, my brain thinks in the positive angles. Notice how when I labeled them, I only labeled the positive angles, right? So there is a way to convert negative angles into positive angles. And you use the concept of the fact that there's 360 degrees in the whole circle, okay? In the whole, um, if you go all the way around one time completely. So what you can do is you can take a negative angle and you can just keep adding 360 degrees until it becomes a positive angle. And we get lucky here because when I add that, I actually get a positive 90, a positive degree the first time I add 360. It is possible that you'll have to keep adding 360 until you eventually end up with um, a positive angle. But here, I just had to add 360 once and I got a positive degree. So what it's telling me is that this is what's called a co-terminal angle, meaning that an angle that goes in the counterclockwise direction, 90 degrees, is going to have the same terminal side as an angle that goes clockwise, 270 degrees. So that means I'm going to go in this direction now, and notice I'm in that same terminal side. Okay, so these two guys are what they call co-terminal. They're two totally different ways to write an angle for the same measurement. Since it landed on the 90, would it be in a quadrant or not? No, and that's a good question because if that happens to me while it's asking me which quadrant I'm in, this one would not be a quadrant. You would actually say you land on the positive y axis. I don't think they do that to you in the homework, but that doesn't mean you'll never see that. So it's either going to land in one of the quadrants or it's going to land on one of the axes. Good question. 
Okay, so for this one, it wants me to go negative 100 degrees, which means I would go clockwise 100 degrees. Now I know that that is 90, right? One, um, this L shape would be 90 degrees. And then a little bit more would probably put me about right there. So I'm guessing that it's right there. Okay, that's my guess on where the negative 100 angle is. But I can confirm if I convert it to a positive angle, that would be a coterminal angle, which should be graphed the exact same way. Let's go verify. So if I take 100 degrees and I add the 360 degrees for the whole complete rotation, I get 260 degrees. Now that makes sense because it's a positive now, meaning I will go in the counterclockwise. And if you notice down here is 270 degrees, right? And so if I'm supposed to be going counterclockwise 260, I would stop a little short of 270. Okay. I personally like to convert my negative angles into positive angles before trying to graph them or trying to visualize them. That's just me. Okay. Some people are okay with going backwards, and, you know, rotating in the other direction. I don't do that. I just change it into a positive and then I go from there. Okay. We have lots and lots and lots of practices. I think there's like 13 different practice problems. So we've got a whole bunch more. Um, let's see, this one is still wanting me to graph it, but it's wanting me to graph 405. So notice that 405, that's more than 360, isn't it? So I know for sure I'm gonna go all the way around, but then how far more am I gonna go after I do that one whole rotation? So when you get numbers that are larger than 360 degrees, you wanna keep subtracting 360 until you end up with something between zero and 360. So for here, I would subtract 360 degrees. I end up with five. Um, I believe I end up with 35 degrees. Let me make sure my brain does funny stuff sometimes. Yep, 45. Okay, so that is between zero and 360. So I know it's somewhere between when I start rotating and when I end rotating. So that where is it going to end up? They're going to end up in the same spot. And 45 degrees is right in the middle of zero and 90. So this would be my angle right here, 45 degrees. Now it's 45 degrees if I went in this direction. And then if I'm going 405, it actually goes one whole rotation and then the 45 degrees. But they are coterminal. They do look the same when you graph them. So this one is negative. I'm going to apply the same thing I did before because my brain does not think clockwise. So I'm going to add 360 degrees. And let's see what I get. Negative 504 plus 360 is negative 144. So notice it's still negative. So again, I'm going to have to add 360 again so that I can make it turn positive. And that should do it. So this is actually coterminal. This measurement is coterminal to this measurement, meaning they will graph exactly the same. But since it's positive, I'm going to go counterclockwise. So 0, 90, 180, 270. It's somewhere in here, um, but it's not too far from that. So I'm going to kind of draw it just a little bit less than halfway through. And again, that's positive, so it's going in this direction.
Now it tells me in practice three. So I've been finding coterminal angles already, except now it's asking me to find two coterminal angles. And so if it's positive, you'll want to subtract 360 until you get a negative, and you'll want to add 360 to get the, uh, the positive. If it's negative, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna add 360 until you get to a positive, and then you're gonna subtract 360 to get another negative. So for this one, I'm going to add 360. So that's zero, one, four, five, 10. So this is the positive coterminal. And then I'm gonna take 150 degrees and I'm gonna minus 360. And that gives me negative 210 degrees. So this is the negative coterminal angle. And it's the same thing for that one. Add 360 and then take away 360. So if I add 360, I get 160 positive. So that's the positive coterminal. And then if I take negative 200 and I subtract 360, that's going to give me negative 560. And that's the negative coterminal. It does ask me for one of each, one positive, one negative. Same thing here, add 360, we get 395 as the positive. And then 35 degrees minus 360. And we get 325 degrees. Um, negative 325 degrees. So that's the negative coterminal. And then the last one, same thing, right? Add 360. So that gives me positive 350 and then subtract 360. And that gives me negative 370. Okay. So that's how you find the coterminals. Go ahead. Uh, what if it was like, um, like the original one was over, like what if it was like 370? And uh -huh. then so when you subtract, it would still be positive for the negative. And keep going. Uh -huh. So if it were this one, let's just say it were that one, and you minus 360, you now have 10 degrees. So you have a positive coterminal, but adding 360 to this is only gonna get me another positive, right? If I were to take the original and then add 360, that would only give me 730, which is another positive. I already got a positive, don't I? Yeah. So that's not gonna help. Don't do it again. What you gotta do again is subtract again. Okay. And then now that gives me negative 370, okay? So the negative code co-terminal has to be like negative one of them has to be negative and one of them has to be positive yep. Okay. Yep, yep and so if if that happens to you you might have to keep adding 360 or you might have to keep subtracting 360 you just keep going in both directions until you get one positive and one negative but that was a very good question okay Let's go ahead and go to practice four. So this one's going to be helpful. My goodness, I'm getting a whole bunch of messages. OK. Um, this one wants us to convert from decimal form or decimal degree form to or no from actually, not to, but from. So this is degree, degree, minutes, and seconds. Notice how they wrote it there, right? So this is degree, minutes, and seconds form, the way it currently is. Let me bro turn this thing down because there's a student messaging me like 10 messages and it's making my phone go off. 
Okay, so that's degree, minutes, and seconds form. What they want is they want to know this is 85 point what degrees, okay? That's what they want to know. So they want to know what does this look like in degree form? And we can convert it into degree form, okay? Um, if I take six seconds, I can multiply that by, or six minutes, sorry. I know that one degree is 60 minutes. And so then the minutes would cancel and I'd be left with a degree unit. I don't know what it is, but I'd be left with a degree unit. So I'm gonna go on my calculator and I'm gonna say six times fraction one over 60. And it gives me a fraction, but that's not what I want. We want decimals, right? So I'm gonna hit the double arrow here to give me the decimals and it's 0 0.1. So six minutes is the same as 0 0.1 degrees. Now what about 15 seconds, right? We also know from that conversion thing that one degree is 3,600 seconds. And so if I stick that in my calculator, 15 times fraction one over 3600. Um, this one, because the denominator is so huge, it did automatically give me a decimal. So I'm gonna go three decimal places. That's 0 0.004. This one will not affect that four. So that's how many degrees I have there. So remember, it's 85 degrees plus these minutes plus these seconds. So for me, I have 85 degrees plus 0 0.1 degrees plus 0 0.004 degrees. And so what does that land me with? It lands me with 85.104 degrees. If you need to type that in your calculator, you can. You don't need to type the degrees. It's just like saying they're all like terms, right? You're just gonna calculate the numbers and the answer will be in degrees. Now this one's tricky because it's missing the minutes. That just means I don't have to worry about the minutes. So let's take the seconds, 10 seconds times one degree over 360 seconds. The decimal form is 0 0.03. My calculator, I got this decimal and the seven does change the two. So this one becomes 0, 0, 003 actually. So then my answer is gonna be negative 300 degrees. And actually that negative applies to the whole thing. So I would suggest that you write it like this. You write the negative in the front and then do the math for the degrees. So you have 300 degrees plus this many degrees, which means you have that many degrees which can just be written as negative 300.003. It's important that you think of the negative not part of the, the degrees, because if I write negative 300 plus this number, it's gonna give me the wrong answer, right? If I do negative 300 plus 0 0.003, notice it takes it away because one of them is negative and one of them is positive. So that's why I mentioned um, it's important that you, I don't know what's going on with this thing. I turned it down and it's not, it's still notifying me all super loud. Okay. So make sure that you combine these numbers first and then just understand that the angle was negative. So don't forget the negative in your final answer. Okay. That's my advice on these is just do the computations for the the dust for the degrees in the minutes and the seconds. If it had a negative in the original, then you're gonna have a negative in your final answer.
Professor? Sure. Um, I'm kind of lost. Um, where did you get the 3,600? Uh, From the conversions. Back here. We had all of these conversions. Oh, OK, I see. OK, and so we know Except that one degree is this, and one degree is this many minutes. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for speaking up because I don't want to keep going if people are confused, right? You want to make sure that everybody's on the same page before you just keep going. <laughs> so thank you for that. Okay. Would it, would it be wrong to just say like that's equal to an hour, like the degree? Um, going. it's not no, not the same. It, I know you want to do that intuitively, right? You want to do that, <laughs> but no, it's not the same. I think I'm still going to do it. <laughs> I know it's very confusing because they use measurements that sound like time, but it's not actually time, but it sounds like time. And then the whole 60 to 60 ratio makes it sound even more like time, but it's not actually time. Yeah, I don't know. That's how I just, I didn't get it at first either. And then I just thought it was time the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's very easy to. I don't know why they use the same word minutes and seconds. I would have used a different word. Okay, so now we're going to go backwards, and backwards is a little bit trickier. Going from the um, degrees, minutes, and seconds to get a decimal degree is actually easier than going the other way around. Okay because you just use these two conversions, one conversion, right, for the minutes and then one conversion for the seconds and then you just add them all up together. That's pretty simple. The other way you can assume is going to be a little bit more, um, it's backwards, it's literally backwards. <laughs> so we have to first take this, okay? Now remember, I am not gonna be talking about that negative. I am just going to deal with this angle, and I know that at the very end, I'm going to write negative in the front, okay? And I'll figure out what my degrees are, what my minutes are, and what my seconds are, okay? But while I'm going through the process, I'm not going to consider that negative because it will throw you off if you try to put it in there, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is just take out the whole number of degrees that I have. So right now, I have 346 degrees. So that leaves me with 0 0.11 degrees. And I know that over here, I'm gonna have 346 degrees. So this is going to be your whole number, right? That number before the decimal, that will always be the number that goes under the degrees. Now for the minutes and the seconds, it's a little bit more complicated. I need to convert this degree into minutes. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to multiply by 60 minutes equals one degree. Okay. And what I get is um, 0 0.11 times 60 is 6.6 .6 minutes. Notice that the degree units would cancel, right? And I'd only be left with the units of minutes. However, only take the whole number part, okay? So this is the whole number of degrees. And then here, you're gonna put the whole number of minutes. And so I'm only gonna put the six there. And so down here, I'm gonna take away that six so that I know what I'm left with because this has to get converted now to seconds, okay? So you're just taking the whole numbers out and then converting the leftovers to the next measurement. So now I wanna convert that to seconds. So I'm gonna use the measurement that um, one minute is equal to 60 seconds. 0 0.6 times 60 is 36 and the minutes will cancel leaving me with the seconds and that is a whole number 
So that's exactly what I type here for my seconds. You wouldn't use the 3600 in the numerator because the 0. 0.6 is on, on the first decimal point, correct? I'm not using the 3600 because this is not degrees. If I was converting from degrees to seconds, then yes, I would use this ratio, just flip it over, right? Yeah. But I'm not converting degrees to seconds. I'm converting minutes to seconds. So look over here at those little measurements we had. Okay, so you use this ratio when you're converting back and forth between degrees and minutes. You use this ratio when you're going converting between minutes and seconds. And then you use this ratio if you're converting from degrees straight to seconds. Okay. Okay. And it doesn't matter who's on top or who's on bottom. You decide that by what you're trying to get, okay? So like here, I had degrees. I didn't want degrees, right? I wanted minutes. So that's why I put the minutes on top because that's what I want. And I put the degrees in the bottom so that the degrees would cancel, okay? Same thing here, I wanted seconds. So I put the seconds on the top and put the minutes on the bottom so the minutes would cancel and I'd be left with seconds. Okay, thank you. Sure. I do appreciate how it's like chemistry and that the formulas cancel each other out so you get to the answer. Yes, if you have had chemistry or I think even maybe in biology, when you start doing all those unit conversions, it's very much just like that process, yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and go to practice six. I think that's kind of hard, this, <laughs> those degree minutes and seconds conversions. Um, but it's something that we got to do because we never know which form we're going to be given the numbers. We need to be able to convert back and forth. Okay. So now this section asks us to find, if possible, complements and supplements for each angle. Okay. And so essentially what you want to do is if you're trying to find the complements, you need to figure out what plus the angle that you're given equals 90 degrees. And if you're trying to find the supplements, it's what plus um, what you're given will give you 180 degrees. Well, it's real easy to solve for the unknown just by subtracting, right? So if you wanna know what the complement is, All you have to do is take 90 degrees minus the angle given. And if you want to find the supplement, then you take 180 degrees minus the angle you're given. So for part A, I would say that my complement is going to be, where did I put my calculator? Here we go. Um, 90 minus 16 is 74. And then 180 degrees minus 16 is 154. 100 and what? No, 164, sorry. I read that wrong. Okay. Now here's the tricky part and why they have that phrase, if possible, in parentheses. Because if you remember, and I'll go back to it in just a second. If you remember, when they gave us the definitions for complements and supplements, they told us that the angles, both of them, had to be positive. So here, both of these guys are positive and they add up to equal 90 degrees, right? So this guy truly is the complement of 16 degrees. These are both positive. And when I add them together, I get 180 degrees, which means this truly is the supplement, okay? But when I get to part C and D, you'll notice that they don't always give you positive answers, okay? So let's do 80 first, just to have another example of when it does work. 
So for the complement, I'm going to take 90 minus 80. So I get 10 degrees for the complement. For the supplement, it's gonna be 180 minus 80, which gives me 100. And so that's my supplemental angle. They were both positive, so those are my answers. But when I move over to this one, part C, I do 90 minus 110, or 111. 90 minus 111. Notice this time I get negative 21 degrees, right? Your complement cannot be negative. It has to be positive, okay? So because it's negative in this particular problem, I would say no complement. I think in your computer, it's gonna have complement and it's gonna have a box and you're just gonna write impossible or type impossible in that box for the complement. It's impossible to find the complement here. The supplement may be different though. 180 minus 111. Well, that actually is not negative. That's actually a positive 69 degrees. So that one is okay. That is the supplement supplemental angle. Okay, so 111 degrees does not have a complement, but it does have a supplement. This one is not going to have either one of them, because when I go to do the complement, I get negative 110, so it doesn't have a complement. And then when I do the supplement, I get negative 20, so it doesn't have a supplement either. Okay, so both of the boxes would be impossible if that were the angle you were given. Okay, so that's why it has that phrase in the parentheses, if possible, because you do have to get positives in order for you to claim that as a complement or a supplement. Okay, now we're finally getting into our radians. Anytime you see pies, you don't even need to write that. Anytime you see pies, it's automatically in radians, okay? But for the sake of introduction, right, they're always gonna write radians at the beginning, okay? But here it says, determine what quadrant in which each angle lies, okay? So before I do that, I want to draw the X and Y axis again. Remember this was zero degrees or 360 degrees. This was 90 degrees. This was 180 and this was 270. Now, we already talked about this is zero rads, but if I go all the way around, it's now two pi rads, okay? So it's two pi to go all the way around. If I only go halfway, then this is the same as saying pi rads. Now, between zero and pi, right here between zero and pi. If I only go halfway, this is pi over two rads. And then if I go three quarters of the way around, this becomes three pi over two rads. Okay, now that's helpful as far as being able to kind of identify where these would go, okay? So if I know that this is zero and this is pi over two, pi over four is directly in the, in the middle. And so for this one, the angle would be right here. 
And this measurement there is pi over four. And which quadrant is that in? That is in quadrant one. Five pi over four, you can think of this as one whole pi plus uh, one over four pi. If you broke it up into a, let me write it like this so that it makes more sense. Just so that you can get the concept. After that, I never write it like this. But you can write that as five fourths times pi. And then you can rewrite the five fourths as a mixed number, one and one fourths pi which means you have one pi plus one fourth pi, which means you're gonna go one whole pi unit plus pi over four. Just so that you could get an idea of where it is, okay? So that means I'm gonna go all the way around one whole pi and then the measurement of pi over four, which basically puts it in the middle there, okay? now. For these problems, I'm doing it this way. In the future, I never try to graph radians the way I'm graphing them right now. Me personally, my brain works better in degrees. And so I personally would convert them to degrees and then be able to tell you where, where it lies, okay? But that's just me because my brain doesn't do this automatically. It just doesn't. Um, I'm lost. Okay, wait. Um, so the five, pi, wouldn't it be five pi? It's five pi over four or mm -hmm. five fourths of a pi? It's the same thing. Five pi over four and five over four pi are the same thing. Why? But, because if I take five pi, five over four times pi, that's the same as saying five over four times pi over one, top times top, five pi, bottom times bottom is four. So they are equivalent. Okay, so with that, wouldn't you go like around five times or like- If you were doing fourths, yes. So you could say this is one fourth, two fourths, three fourths, four fourths, five fourths, yes. But then your brain would literally have to break up that whole circle into fourths. I'm th I thought of it as like, um, like each pi like goes, okay, so you know how 360 is two pies, so you just go around twice and then you do a 180. Okay, yeah, that's the same thing, sorry. No, you're good. So like if you have from zero to pi, that's one whole pi, right? Going from here to here is one whole pi. And because this is in force, you would have to cut this one pi into force. So it's already cut in half, right? And if you cut those halves in half, like that, this is pi over four, this is two pi over four, which reduces to pi over two, this is three pi over four, and then this is four pi over four, which is pi. Okay. And then I can go even one more and say five pi over four. Okay, thank you. That is another way to show it, you got it. That's good, thank you. And so it wouldn't matter what that denominator is. If it were six, then you would have to cut the top half into six equal pieces, okay? And then once you have those six equal pieces, you literally just count five of them. It won't give you anything that complicated yet, but <laughs> it can happen in the future. So which quadrant am I in? Third. Mm -hmm. So this one would be quadrant three as the answer. Again, my brain doesn't like to cut up the pie, the circle. It doesn't like to do all that. So my brain would not do any of this. If I had this problem on the test, I would literally convert this to, decimal, to degrees and then count my degrees around. And we will get to that in a little bit. I think it's like practice nine or practice 10. Um, yeah. It's already practice dun, 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 converting. It's actually not so practice 12 that will take the radians and convert them into degrees.
Okay, so this one now says for us to sketch these. I've sketched them just so that I could figure out the quadrants, um, but you can sketch these now. It wants us to sketch them. So notice that that one has five, and I just talked about how to do that, right? Here's zero, here's pi. You have to cut this pi into five equal pieces. So I don't know, that's probably gonna look something like this. Okay, and you have to imagine like this one, one, two, three, four, five. You have to like imagine that that's not there. Okay. So that this is one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I've cut the whole pie into five equal pieces. You do have the y axis here. It's just not one of the fits. Okay, so when I start counting, I'm not going to count that. And then do the same for the bottom. So here, 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 and here. Again, this is not one of the slices, but it is the y axis. So I wanna go nine fifths. I wanna go over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But notice there's a negative. So I don't get to go in this normal direction that we normally have been going in. I have to go in the other direction and count nine fifths. So if I start counting, here's one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, five fifths, six fifths, seven fifths, eight fifths, and nine fifths. This is where I end up. So that will be where my terminal side is. The next one's a whole lot easier because it's just two. <laughs> and we already have the line cut into two. Here's zero, here's pi, and we already have it cut into halves. So when I'm counting five halves, I'm going to count one pi half, two pi halves, three pi halves, four pi halves, five pi halves. So I end up here. And that's my terminal set. And I did go in this direction because the angle was positive. So I was going counterclockwise. You will definitely, I highly suggest when you're going through the homework that you have this video <laughs> next to you and you can like rewind it and fast forward it to whichever part looks like the problems in the homework because it's a lot of information to remember. We won't use all of it all the time, but it is important that you're aware so that way if you see something, you kind of have an idea of reference, okay? The most part, what we'll be doing is the conversions. That's really the biggest thing we're gonna get from this whole section is converting back and forth between radians and degrees, okay? That is like the biggest concept out of the whole section. We have to do the homework, so we have, you know, different kinds of problems throughout the whole section, but the big takeaway from this section is gonna be how to convert. If you take anything with you into calculus, it's gonna be how to convert between radians and degrees. Okay, so now here we go with this coterminal stuff again, okay? So it says determine two coterminal angles, one positive and one negative for each angle. It's the same process. Before it was degrees, so we were adding 360 degrees or taking away 360 degrees until we ended up with one positive and one negative, right? Here, we have to do it in radians. So you need to remember that 360 degrees is the same as two pi radians, okay? Two different kinds of measurements, but they are equivalent. So instead of adding and subtracting 360 degrees, we're gonna be adding and subtracting two pi. So I'm gonna take pi over six and add two pi. And then I'm gonna take pi over six and subtract two pi. 
And the nice thing about your calculator is there is a pie button if you choose to use it and it will reduce some leaving the pie. So let me show you an example. I can type that button right there that has pie, fraction, six, go over to the side, plus two, and then the pie button again. And I, when I hit enter, it's gonna give me my answer with pies in it already. So I know that this is 13 over six pie. Now, whether you put the pie here or you put the pie at the top, it's the same thing, okay? That's the positive. So we've got one of the coterminals. Let's go see if this one will give us a negative. I believe it will. And I don't know if you know how to use this calculator, but for me, if I can prevent myself wasting time typing stuff in the calculator, I will. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the top arrow and it's gonna keep going up to all my entries. I only needed to go up to the one I wanted, which was that one. Once it's highlighted, whatever you want, if you hit enter, it's gonna copy it, okay? And then all I do is hit this left arrow and change that plus sign into a minus sign. Just so I don't have to retype everything all over again, right? It'll help save a little bit of time once you start getting used to the calculator. Um, and that one gives me negative 11 pi over six. So that's nice. We have one positive and we have one negative. Now let's go see about this guy. And just as before, when we had the degrees, if you're getting two positives, then you need to go in the other direction and start taking away more, okay? Or if you're getting two negatives, then go in the opposite direction and keep adding more, more two pies. So let's see, we're gonna add two pi and then we're gonna take away two pi and let's see what happens. So negative five pi over six plus two pi is seven pi over six. Then I'm gonna copy, change that to a minus and I get negative 17 pi over six. So Sorry, I was, I was looking down both times you were putting that fraction part up. How do you put the fraction on the calculator? You use this fraction button right here. It's fraction. right above the seven. If you hit it, it opens up a template and you can put whatever you want at the top. Okay, I got and it. Then you yeah, um, down arrow to get to the bottom. Thank and then you. when, you're, when you're done, make sure you hit the right arrow to go to the side. Perfect. You'll see you do it like 10 million more times. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so now we're in practice 10. We're getting there. We're inching our way toward the end, but there are lots of practices. There's 18 practices total, so we're about halfway. Um, huh. Okay, so practice 10 says, oh, here we go again, complements and supplements if possible. Remember, they have to be positive in order for you to have one, okay? So now we need to know we know that 180 degrees is the same as pi, right? When we've been drawing it on the x and y axes, but 90 degrees is equal to pi over two, okay? So instead of doing 90 degrees minus our angle, we're going to be doing pi over two minus our angle because we're in totally different measurement here, okay? So for this particular problem, it's gonna be pi over two minus pi over eight, which is three pi over four, I believe. Just let me double check, because sometimes my brain does funny things. So fraction pi over two, go to the side, minus fraction pi over eight. Oh, three pi over eight, I had the wrong denominator. So always confirm. I just like to just double check with my calculator. That way I'm not getting wrong answers just because I think I know what I'm doing. Um, 180 degrees minus our angle is what we were doing before. But since we have radians, we can't put uh, degrees and radians together. Okay. So we have to do pi minus our angle. So for this problem, it would be pi minus pi over eight. And that one I'm pretty sure is seven pi over eight, but double check. Pi minus fraction pi over eight. 
and it is seven pi over eight. Okay, so this one does have a complement and it has a supplement. Now we'll do the same for B. So we're gonna do pi over two minus seven pi over eight. Pi over two minus seven pi over eight. And I get negative three pi over eight. So it's a negative, which means for the complement, we're gonna write impossible. Remember, it had to be positive in order for it to exist. And here we do get a positive pi over eight. So it does have a complement. It just doesn't have, I'm sorry, it has a supplement. It just doesn't have a complement. And then the last one, just for some extra practice, we're gonna take away the five pi over three. And what is that? Pi over two, take away five pi over three. I get negative seven pi over six. So for the complement, it's impossible. And then let's go check out the supplement. pi minus five pi over three. I get negative two pi over three, another negative. So now for the supplement, you'll also say impossible, okay? So you have to get positives in order for them to be complements or supplements. Okay. Next one, finally get to start converting here. So we have to convert between radians and um, degrees. And so our biggest conversion that we're gonna use is that 180 degrees equals one pi. Now, which one goes on the top of the fraction and which one goes at the bottom of the fraction depends on what we have and what we're trying to get to, right? So since we have decim uh, degrees, you want the degrees to be downstairs so that they wipe out and you're left with those radians. Like I mentioned before, they do not write the word radians. Notice how it doesn't say the word rads up here. It does, but it's just automatically understood if there's no unit. Okay, so here, oh gosh, that's gonna give me 45 pi over 180, which I'm pretty sure reduces. 45 pi over 180, and the calculator reduces it for me. So it's pi over four. The same thing with that one, it's degrees. So I need to put the 180 degrees downstairs, the pi up top, we get 60 pi because the little degree symbols cancel over 180, which reduces to pi over three. The conversion is the same. It's just your answer is going to be negative because this is a negative angle. So you still multiply by pi over 180 and you get negative 80 pi over 180. And that one I'm a little bit not sure. It's negative four pi over nine. The calculator reduced it for me. Same thing for this one. So we get 20 pi over 180. And then that one is pi over nine. So you do wanna make sure you reduce it. If you try to type this in there, it's probably gonna tell you it's not in its simplest form. And notice it says, do not use the calculator. It doesn't mean typing this in the calculator to reduce it. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is converting in your calculator because your calculator will convert between um, decimals and um, degrees and radians. 
right now you'll notice that my calculator, I don't know if you can see it, but right there it says degree. And so my calculator is in degree mode. And actually for mode, it should be in radians by default. Because remember I told you radians are the units we use that don't even say any units. So by default, it should be in radiant mode. You are gonna need to toggle back and forth between radiant mode and degree mode. Um, later, when we start talking about trigonomic functions, sometimes you're gonna take the trig of a degree and sometimes you're gonna take the trig value of a radian. And so you have to make sure your calculator is in the right mode in order for it to give you the correct answer. We will address that later when we get to that section about the modes, okay? Because I've had a lot of people get the answers wrong on the test just because their calculator was not in the right mode. You do need to know how to use that calculator um, and how to put it in the right modes. Okay. So that's going in one direction, from degrees to the radians. Now we're gonna go backwards, which is from the radians to the degrees. I'm still gonna use that same conversion, the same fact in order to do this conversion. But this time I wanna end up with degrees. So I want the degrees on the top and you want the pies at the bottom to cancel with the other pies, okay? So those will cancel and I'll end up with whatever four times 180 is, 720 degrees. And if I reduce that, I get 240 degrees. And same thing for this one. I want to end up with degrees. So the degrees go on top, pies go on the bottom. These cancel. And I get 900 over six which is 150 degrees. And I'm just continuing the process. I just want you to recognize that the process doesn't change no matter what the problem looks like. So here, pi's cancel. I get negative 1440 over five. So negative 288 degrees. Here the pies will cancel. And so then I end up with 300 degrees. Okay, so just extra, extra practice of each of those. You're gonna get random numbers, so I don't know what numbers you're gonna get, but you have a whole process to follow. Let me grab some water real quick. Okay, now this one says convert the degrees to radians, but this time it doesn't say to keep the multiple of pi. It just says to round to three decimal places. So I'm going to do it the exact same way. I want radians, so I'm going to put the pi on the top, and I want to get rid of the degrees, so I'm going to put the degrees at the bottom, right? I'm still using that same conversion. So the degrees will cancel. I'll end up with 60 pi over 180. And if I do it exactly the way I did it before, I'm going to end up with pi over 3. But that's not what they want. They want it to be in decimals. So all you have to do is type pi over three in your calculator. And of course, it by default wants to leave it like that because that's normally how we write radians is in terms of pi. But if you want the degrees, I mean, I'm sorry, decimal, hit the double arrow at, next to the enter button and it will change it to decimal. So this is the decimal representation of that. Remember, pi is just 3.14159, blah, 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 right? A bunch of decimals, okay? So that is a decimal. And when you divide it by three, this is what you get. So we're gonna round it to three decimal places. One, two, and the one is not enough to change this seven. So it's gonna be 1.047. So it's all the same process, only thing different 
is I have to actually hit the double arrow in order to get um, this decimal answer. I'm trying to draw a double arrow, but it's not working out for me. There we go. Okay, and then the reverse, same thing. If I have radians and I wanna get to degrees, I have to put the degrees on the top, the radians at the bottom, the pies will cancel. I'll end up with 180 over 13, and then 180 over 13. Calculator wants to leave it like that, but if I hit the double arrow, it'll give me the decimal. So this is 13.846. And it is degrees. Um, is this where you put uh, you put on the last one the equals around? Do you use that for here too? Say it again. Yeah. Um, for practice thirteen, you put equals to around, so you put that there too. Mm hmm Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, would it be wrong if you put it wrong like that, or would it um, make a difference? What do you want to put? An equal sign instead of the around equal. Rounding, it, I'm not particular like that. The computer will have the rounding symbol. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that bad. <laughs> if you do it like I did and you just said that that was equal, even though you actually rounded, I'm okay with that. That's good. I know where this came from, which is what's important, okay? Technically, it should be the wavy one, right? Because I did round it. But I'm not, I'm not, I mean, yes, notation is fantastic, but when it comes to equal signs, equals are the wavies, it's not that big of a deal. My notation, when I mean that is like, when you draw a pie, does it actually look like a pie? Or are you doing this? Like, I can't even tell if that's part of a fraction. Like, is this a fraction with 11 downstairs, right? Like, that's what I mean by notation. Okay, let's see here. The questions, though, I'm glad you guys are asking questions. Okay, practice 15 says, find the length of an arc on a circle of radius r intercepted by the central angle theta. So we've got to remember our formulas for the length of an arc, okay? The formula is S represents the length of the arc, and it's just R times theta. The tricky part is, is that theta has to be in radians. So for this problem, I could do this problem right away. It would be 42 for my R and pi over six for my radians, and I could give them the decimal number. That's gonna be seven pi, which is actually equal to 21.9. Didn't tell me how much to round it to, so I'm just gonna say 991. In web assignment, it'll tell you what to round it to. I probably just forgot to write my directions, okay? And if you don't believe me, that's seven. You can always do 42 times pi over six. And it is seven pi. And if I hit the double arrow, it is 21.99. Okay, I'm gonna do this last one and then we're gonna stop because we are not gonna have time. Our class is supposed to end at 2.50. So we're not gonna have time to go over um, practices 16, 17, um, and that's it, 16 and 17. So we're like, oh no, and 18. We're like two, three examples from finishing, okay? So you could try your homework assignment with this information, or you can wait until we talk more about this section on Thursday to start the homework for 6.1, okay? Either way, I'm good. You just won't have an example um, explained out by me for the last few problems, okay? What does the homework do? Not till the 20th. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for this one, I want to plug it in there, but I can't because this is not in the correct measurement. So I do have to convert it to radians. So I'm going to put my radians on the top, my degrees on the bottom. 
prime divided by 180. So this gives me five pi over three. When I put it in the calculator, it gave me five pi over three. So now I can calculate it. It'll be 15 times five pi over three. And let's see what that decimal is. So 15 times five pi over three. And it says 25 pi, but I want the decimal. So I hit the double arrow. Oh, this one has a nine and an eight. So it actually goes to five, four, zero. Double check your web assign because I don't know if it makes you go three decimal places or two decimal places. It usually picks one of those two. But I'm gonna stop here. Again, like I said, we have three more example problems, but I don't wanna go into those just yet. So when we come in on Thursday, I'm gonna finish these last three problems and then we'll continue with 6.2. Um, if you don't have any questions, you are free to go. If you have a question, go ahead and ask. And then Bethany, make sure you stay on so that we can get your web assigned fixed before you leave. Well, then, guys, you have a great day, okay? And I will see you on Thursday.